You're listening to A Climate Change. Uh, this is Matt Mattern, your host, and I've got Dr. Sally Uren on the program. Uh, Dr. Uren is a uh, doctorate in environmental science. She's the chief executive for Forum for the Future. Uh, she's a global expert and leader in sustainable development. She's been with Forum for the Future for over 20 years. She's uh, been featured in Time Magazine, Forbes, Green Business, Reuters, The Huffington Post, New Statesman, Management Today. She's been all over the news. Uh, she serves as a judge for the King's Award for Sustainable Development in the UK. And uh, welcome to the program, Sally. Thank you. Good to be here. Well, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, your trajectory of how you ended up in the environmental movement. What what led you on this path? Great question. Um, I have always been interested in nature. I was a little bit of a nerd when I was growing up and I did a degree in biology because it was so long ago that environmental science wasn't a thing. And it was during my degree that I began to get interested in the impacts of pollution on ecosystems. And critically, my research was focused on how do you restore ecosystems? And um, there's a part of the UK called Manchester. Um, there's Salford Keys in Manchester. That used to be called Salford Docks. It was one of the most polluted waterways in the UK. And in the third year of my degree, I was involved in cleaning it up. And um, we went from a really polluted water course to um, one that was clean, that had you know thriving flora and fauna inside it. And I just was really exhilarated at that prospect of regeneration and restoration. And so I did a PhD looking at impacts of pollution on ecosystems and how you reverse those impacts. And then I went out to the rainforest of Borneo, got involved in reforesting logged over forest, again, working at how you get regeneration of forest. And so it's the possibility of restoring damage, but not just being less bad, but creating something even better that I guess is where this all comes from. Well, that's a great story. Um, so how did that lead you to form for the future? Yeah, so I was um, in academia for a while. Um, so I was in Borneo doing a postdoctoral research fellowship, which is quite a mouthful, and couldn't quite decide whether to stay in academia and publish papers and become a grandee in academic circles. And it was out in the rainforest of Borneo, which was at the height of all the illegal deforestation. And I just had a moment when I realized the world does not need any more papers by SUN. I need to take everything I've learned and apply it particularly into the private sector. And so I came back to the UK and at that point really had two options. I could join a campaigning nonprofit or I could go and work in consultancy. So I became an air quality consultant involved in planning applications for big infrastructure developments. And that broadened out into sustainability, created a sustainability group then realized I was a terrible consultant because I never actually did what anyone asked me to do because I didn't think it was ambitious enough. And at that point, got talking to Jonathan Porritt, who just set up Forum, and I moved over to Forum and have not looked back since. Well, uh, I interviewed uh, Sir Jonathan Porritt uh, a while back, uh, a wonderful gentleman. And uh, yeah, so I could see following in his footsteps would be uh, kind of a natural path. Yeah, he, and he was a great, great mentor for me as well. I still is. So how did you two work together? What kind of brought you two together? Um, we could both really see that the private sector had, at that point, a really untapped role in creating accelerated progress towards sustainable development and how we first worked together, literally, I think I carried his bag and we would go to meetings and, um, you know, he would do the sort of Jonathan Porritt chairing and wonderful eloquence. And I was sitting there thinking, wow, this is amazing. How do you communicate like that? Um, and I learned a lot from Jonathan. And um, yeah, so I was basically just trailing around after him for quite a while and then learned the tricks of the trade and um, began to be, be that person that people would listen to in meetings sometimes not always um but yeah we worked very closely together in the early days of forums business program between us we were involved in lots of really exciting partnerships and 
then more latterly, Jonathan was a trustee, so slightly less removed. But um, yeah, I'm still very much in contact with him. And as I say, we were both really struck by the role of the private sector, which at this point, 20 odd years ago, wasn't really a source of much interest. And in fact, when Jonathan set up Forum and started to work with business, he had come from Friends of the Earth and was criticized for working with business. And now if you look at all of the nonprofits from Greenpeace to Friends of the Earth, they all engage with business because we have to engage with the private sector. We also have to engage with government, civil society, but the private sector is critical if we're going to get to where we need to get to. Well, absolutely true. I mean, uh, we have to harness the power of the private sector to um, get people working on these projects to get them completed. And uh, so tell us a little bit about uh, the the private sector, uh, you know, work that you've done or collaborating with various private sector groups. Sure. Um, I guess our engagement with the private sector forum is alongside our engagement with civil society, with government, because we do take a systems view and we know we need to work with all actors in a system. Specifically in terms of private sector engagement, two main ways we engage. We have partnerships with leading organizations where we'll co-create strategies, build capacity for deep and urgent transformation. And then we also run a number of pre-competitive collaborations looking at issues such as regenerative agriculture, um, how do we accelerate action at the intersection of climate and health? How do we scale renewable energy? And you know, increasingly, as a neutral convener, we're able to bring lots of organizations together, often competitors, but in a pre-competitive space to really work together to tackle these shared challenges. So let's let's talk about agriculture for a second. And, and what are some of the things that you've seen as successes uh, that Forum for the Future has been involved in? And what are some of the areas that still need a lot of work to uh, make progress and kind of maybe you could tell us hey where are we at kind of on that path are we 10 percent yeah. of the way there or two percent of the way there or that's a great question um so at forum we're focused on three transitions one is the transition of the energy system one is the transition of the role of business but the third is food and agriculture and so we do a lot of work in regenerative agriculture and if you think about how you conceptualize systemic change, then there's usually three phases. You have to create the case for change. That's when a system starts to move. Then you have accelerated system change, which is really messy and volatile. That's kind of where we are right now with many of our systems. And then you have the sort of stabilization of a new system. And with food and ag, I think we've just tipped into that accelerated phase of systemic change. The case for change is really clear. We've got soil quality in many parts of the world, which won't sustain the crop harvest that we need. We've built a food system on the back of the Second World War that is incredibly extractive, that isn't delivering nutrition in an equitable way to a growing population. And so we need to shift the goals of the food system to goals of regenerative. So equal access to nutrition, really bringing goods and services to market in a way that restores ecosystems, that critically delivers cost of production to the smallholder, People don't want to go into agriculture because actually it's hard to make a living. And so I think we, and I mean, we as like everyone involved in this space, we've articulated a different set of goals for the system. There's lots of activity to enable the transition of the system. I just look at, I look kind of at the uh, US ag system, which I don't know how, how different it is from the, you know, the UK system or other systems. But uh, the U.S. system seems still very dominantly controlled by extractive uh, type players. And I mean, in part because the food system is controlled by mostly uh, major food companies that are not really fully engaged in the process of uh, using healthy uh, inputs and and uh, a lot of pesticides and all these kinds of things are still being sprayed on crops and, and the like. I think the U.S. Ag system is in transition. I think you've got some really thoughtful brands such as General Mills, who we do a lot of work with, that are really serious about regenerative agriculture. And they've just announced a partnership with Walmart to convert, I think, 600 hectares of land to regenerative agriculture. Now, in part, that's because the existential crisis in food is really real. 
you know, there literally are some parts of the world where there might be two crops left because soil quality is so poor. But I think there's just an incredible energy flowing into this space, which is understanding that if we can restore agriculture, then we can deal with impacts of climate. We can build in climate adaptation. We can also address issues around social equity and inequality. And so, yes, food and ag in the US has got its issues. It is extractive in parts. But I would say there's an increasing number of big players that recognize the way that we extracted the agricultural system in the past isn't how we're going to go forward. And increasing brands are now really getting serious about regenerative agriculture. We're not there yet. Um, and, you know, have all these organizations completely converted? No, they haven't. That is work in progress. But I would say Regen Ag in the US right now is a really exciting space. Well, you're listening to A Climate Change. Uh, we've got Dr. Sally Uren, environmental scientist, uh, chief executive of Forum for the Future, and we'll be right back. Uh, great discussion with her about uh, many of the most important topics that we're facing. You're listening to A Climate Change. I've got Dr. Sally Uren, environmental scientist and chief executive for Forum for the Future. And uh, Sally, prior to the break, we were talking about uh, the state of agriculture uh, particularly related to the U.S. And yes, I do see spots of, um, you know, bright spots on we've got uh, a number of stores that promote um, food that does not have pesticides or, do you know, does not use GMOs and stuff like that. So I do see a lot more of that. I guess I just want to I want to see more change and more quickly because I do know that uh, our ag system is still dominated by by major farmers that use tons of pesticides and and how long is that going to go on for um you know do you have any guess as to how how quickly this accelerated phase is going to take till we get to a point a tipping point where you know more than 50 percent of our agriculture is using regenerative techniques and the like I wish I had a crystal ball, and I always say that predicting the future is usually a fool's game. However, I think this could be quite quick because converting to more regenerative agriculture can actually save you money. You're saving on input costs that you no longer need. The big biggest barrier is that conversion phase um, on, on land. So often what you find is when you convert your practices, there might be a slight dip in yield, which... If you're already, you know, really struggling in terms of financial sustainability, that can be super tough. And that's why I love the work of organizations like Rabobank, who are going to work with the farmers, looking at different ways of accessing capital. I love this whole notion of ecosystem business models. So we can create revenue from restoring soil health, from improving ecosystems. And so I think if we can get that financial unlock working at scale, then it could be really, really quick. Um, the thing we have to remember is in any systemic change, there are always resisting forces. And the closer you get to a system changing, the stronger they become. That is what's beginning to happen, I think, in sustainability more broadly right now. There are individuals, organizations that don't want a sustainable energy system. They don't want a sustainable food system because actually this system really suits them. And so they're digging in. Um, excuse the metaphor, we're talking about agriculture, but it's really real. But if we know about this and we understand that this is happening, then we can engage, we can understand the motivation. And they may come with us, they may not come with us. But I think the impetus for change now is really uncontestable. Climate change isn't going to go anywhere. We've already baked in serious climate disruption. And I think people are beginning to realize that and asking, so what can we do about that? Well, if we shift our energy and food systems really, really quickly, then we might avoid the worst of climate change. Well, I guess I, I look at the U.S. system in terms of just the governmental funding uh, funds, kind of the, the system that we know, and uh, which is the extractive model. And uh, given kind of the general dysfunction of the U.S. government at this point in time, particularly at the federal level, uh, it's hard to see that we're going to have any kind of massive change. Uh, I don't know. Maybe maybe you're seeing something or have your ear to the ground as to uh, changes at the Department of Agriculture that is 
that are moving in that direction? What I do know is the Inflation Reduction Act, which is a really bold set of financing to enable US to transition energy and food, is interestingly proving able in some cases to step across the politicization of this agenda. Money is flowing into climate adaptation, to climate smart agriculture, is flowing into renewable energy provision, renewable energy manufacturing, and that's bringing jobs. And jobs are really important. And I've seen the political shift happen in some regions when actually it's become really clear that the IRA is a way of funding the transition and actually could deliver economic benefit at a really local level. And so I think let's not forget about the Inflation Reduction Act. Yes, there's all sorts of dysfunctionality elsewhere. The farm bill is going to get postponed. But the Inflation Reduction Act is a really powerful lever for change because it's fast-tracking capital into the transition. And that is the bit that is the unlock. We need money to make this transition and the Inflation Reduction Act is providing that. And any politician wants to say, I help create new jobs. And they're able to say that with the funding from the IRA. I guess I'd say a couple of things. One is my concern about our animal centric uh, ag policy, which I mean, most of our most of our uh, crops are used to feed animals and and that's not exactly sustainable. Um, and yet uh, I don't see any dramatic reduction in that in that area. And it seems like that is an area that has to be shifted in order to really have restore the environment in a big way. Would you agree? And, and if so, what, what's the change? Yeah, I, I, I do think so. We need to see a dietary shift. Um, we need to see a shift from huge reliance on animal protein, which is incredibly carbon intensive to more plant based protein. So at Forum, we're not an either organization. We wouldn't ever say it's meat or it's not meat, because there are some parts of the world where grazing livestock is really brilliant for the environment. It helps maintain the landscape. The carbon intensity is, is much lower. And so we need to ask ourselves, what is that optimal blend of animal and plant based protein that's in line with planetary boundaries, that's in line with the principles of regenerative agriculture. So you can have sustainable dairy, you can have really unsustainable dairy. But I think we do need to reduce the reliance on often crops that are perfectly fit for human consumption going to animal feed, because that doesn't make any sense. So one of the projects we've been involved with in forum is called the protein challenge. And we've done a lot of work on sustainable animal feed. So if you shift the animal feed, you tell a different story about the carbon. So there's plenty we can do to bring down the carbon intensity of livestock. We're not doing enough. We do, though, need on balance to eat less meat. Well, tell us, how how would you see um, uh, if raising meat, raising beef and other forms of animal protein more sustainably, what does that look like? Well, as I say, it's thinking about the feedstock. So how do you use feedstock that actually is not fit for human consumption, that is, is waste material? There's lots of innovations in that space. How the animals are tended for and grazed. Um, we know that some of these really intensive farming, um, manufacturing, well, they are manufacturing, aren't they? These intensive farming um installations can be incredibly carbon intensive. But equally, we know that there are some some sustainable dairy installations that, you know, I've got a very light carbon footprint. We know how to do this. It's more that there is huge resistance in the system for change. It goes back to everything I see at the moment tells me that we know how to create a sustainable food system. We know how to create a sustainable energy system. We are experiencing a lot of pushback right now from very well-funded resisting forces and so we just need to be really clear about the pathways to get to a sustainable food system and we know what that looks like and it and we need to avoid it's no meat or some meat because that's just polarizing because the other thing that's happening is we tend to be very binary it's this or it's that and that just creates polarization and we've lost the whole gaze on what we're trying to achieve here so this whole transition is way more nuanced than anyone would care to really accept 
it is nuanced. And so there are some parts of the US where animal livestock production makes a huge amount of sense. It's being done very carefully, very thoughtfully in line with ecosystem assets. Other parts where it isn't. We need to shine a light on the really great practice and scale that and transition in a way that's thoughtful. We don't want people to lose their jobs. So that's where this whole notion of just transition for me is so critical right now. How do we transition our food and our energy system in a way that doesn't leave people behind, that doesn't play into the politicization of this agenda, that is actually thoughtful? And we actually know how to do that. Well, I guess the question is, how do you get a big meat consumer, such as one of the big restaurant chains or McDonald's or whoever, you know, probably uh, uses as much meat or chicken as anywhere else, get them committed to using environmentally sustainable uh, animal products and and where are we at where are we at in that process i think we're making good progress um i think mcdonald's are a good example they're doing huge amounts in sustainable livestock um what you will hear though is a reluctance to go too far ahead of the consumer um and a, a worry that the consumer isn't ready for you know sustainable beef or switching to to plant-based proteins. And I would just say, we can't wait for consumer demand for sustainable food. We need to step over the myth it costs more. It doesn't, it can actually save money. And we need to accept that consumer sentiment is a lagging indicator, not a forward indicator. And we need all of these big brands to just be slightly ahead of the consumer. Yes, still sell meat, but yes, also sell delicious, tasty plant-based protein, which it can be all of that. And understand what their role is in a sustainable future. And it's not quite the same role that they have today. Well, I uh, I was at a restaurant just a few days ago and I was getting a pasta, it was bolognese sauce, and it was made with impossible meat. And I I really would have said it was meat had I not known. I mean, it really was so close to to meat that it it really was hard to tell the difference. So you're listening to a climate change. I've got Dr. Sally Uren, an environmental scientist, chief executive of Forum for the Future. We'll be right back in just one minute. You're listening to a climate change. This is Matt Mattern, and I've got Dr. Sally Uren on the program. Uh, she's a chief executive for Forum for the Future. Uh, Sally, we were talking before the break about private sector in the ag world um, and kind of want to pivot to maybe the energy sector for a minute and talk about what the private sector is doing there. I just recently was looking at, uh, you know, an article where um, the Exxon chief CEO was was admitting, hey, climate change is real and, and trying to say that Exxon is doing stuff to help. It's it's kind of uh, questionable, given the fact that Exxon had done its best to hide the role of uh, the oil industry in creating this uh, existential threat that we have. Um, what are the some of the angels and devils that you see out there in the private sector that are driving change for the good and those who are kind of stuck in the past and uh, seem to have a devil may care attitude towards the destruction to the environment that their that their companies are creating i guess thank you for that question before i give you and i tend to shine a light on devils and not speak uh, angels even and not speak about the devils but before i do that you've got to ask yourself why did exxon hide the science you know their predictions actually turned out to be pretty spot on you know, why was there so much resistance in the oil and gas industry to deal with climate, to embrace renewable technology? And I think one of the reasons is just to focus on short-term profit maximization. I think this kind of fixation with quarterly returns, which is still being driven by a huge part of the investment world, is one of the drivers that we're dealing with here, not the bad people in oil and gas. You know, they are often just responding to their shareholders. And so the angels then that I see are those organizations that have taken a longer term view and see their role in society quite differently. One of the best examples in energy 
is the transition of Dong Energy into Allstead. So Allstead now is one of the leaders in renewable energy provision and has kind of just repurposed its business as being part of the solution for renewable energy because it looked into the future and in a world where there are carbon trading mechanisms, where there's a price on each ton of carbon dioxide emitted, then your business model doesn't really work so well. So that long-term view gave them an understanding of what that transition needed to look like. And you're seeing other organizations in energy really becoming quite clear about that. So for me, it's not about the devils and the angels per se. It's like, what's driving this behavior? And I just think this absolute fixation on short-term profit maximization, which is underpinning a casino economy that's working for the very, very few. One stat that I always quote, but it, it for me signifies the challenge if the economy carries on as it's doing today, by 2030, 99% of the world's wealth will be held by 1% of um, the, the population. That just doesn't make any sense at all. And so the organizations that I really want to celebrate are those that have taken a long-term view, have reimagined their role in society, have understood how to create value from creating some of the solutions that we know we need to see. And the devils are those that are just stuck in the past, that are digging on really actually quite powerfully to a status quo that will lead us to a hothouse earth. And if any investors listen to your program, Matt, I would really ask them to go and look at their portfolios and ask if they carry on investing as they are doing today, where are they going to get sources of value creation? Because there will always be parts of the world where you can emit carbon dioxide because I don't think we're ever going to get a binding agreement that brings in every nation state. But there are certain trading blocks. EU will be the first where there'll be a price on carbon. And actually, you're not going to make the money that you're making today. So get out of it. Transition rapidly and just do it seriously. Well, that, uh, that is really the failure of the market and that uh, essentially the marketplace, as described by Adam Smith, just did not price in. Um, pollution, because pollution wasn't a factor 250 years ago. And and uh, John Locke wrote about stewardship. And uh, unfortunately, uh, that lesson kind of got lost in business school. And uh, our business schools here in, in Europe uh, did not account for stewardship. It wasn't taught to modern business leaders that that was a part of what they should be doing. And they started to look at, like you said, short-term profit, profits were the measure of whether you were a good business leader. And there just has to be a shift in that view, which, uh, and we've got to have a price for carbon, quite frankly, because uh, essentially we're not pricing, we're not having corporations pay the true price or us as consumers to pay the true f price of the products that we use. And that that's that's really a huge problem. And I echo your your uh, comments about shareholders. We all need to take a look at our portfolios and say, hey, um, do we want to be holding shares of uh, big polluters? And is that is that how we want to um, have our legacy be be known? And and I think the answer is no. And it, to the extent that we move into shares of companies that are doing the ethical and responsible thing, the market will take notice. But we we kind of, as shareholders, need to let the market know what we feel. Yeah, and I think, you know, I often get asked, well, what can we as individuals do? And if you are lucky enough to have savings or a pension, find out where that money is invested because you may get a really nasty surprise. It could be invested in, a sovereign wealth fund that is currently funding the war between Russia and the Ukraine. It could be invested in an oil and gas industry that's got no, no appetite to transition at all. But find out where your money is, because actually pensions in particular underpin a lot of the machinery of our global economy. And, you know, if thousands and millions of people demanded to see their money put in service of the transition of the energy system, the transition of the food system, then people would listen. And it's already happening. You already see activists, um, shareholders, activists, pension holders. So I'm just struck by the fact that many people have no idea 
where their money is invested. So find out. Right. So uh, where do you see us in terms of uh, COP28 that's coming up and, and it's going to be in Dubai, which is kind of ground zero for the extractive oil economy and fossil fuels in general? Um, what what are you looking to do there and uh, what do you think the challenges are and what are the opportunities that you see in working with the um, the Gulf states to to create a, a regenerative future are they are they part are they going to be partners in this yeah i think the word the two words of 2023 for me will be cognitive dissonance and so flying flying thousands of people to dubai to discuss climate the cognitive dissonance that is not lost on me at all stepping over that what are we at Forum for the Future hoping to achieve at COP28, we are launching a toolkit that will enable private sector actors to really take action at the intersection of climate and health. So to push net zero strategies even further, to talk about health benefits. We tend to treat climate and health as two separate issues. They are, in fact, one and the same issues. We already are, are witnessing that. So we're launching a toolkit that we hope will accelerate private sector action in this space. Um, more broadly, it's what's called a stop take year for COP. And again, the cognitive distance is we know we're already miles away from making the progress that we need to see. And I guess my hope is that in particular, we will see more intergovernmental cooperation. I think the private sector by and large kind of understands what it needs to do. But what it will say is one of the enablers is public policy, is government policy, it's policy that's stable, that doesn't flip-flop from one position to another. And so for me, I will be really interested to see what happens behind closed doors in the negotiations that are involving, you know, the big heavy carbon emitters, plus the newer entrants to our global economy for whom the economic case to rapidly decarbonize isn't there because they know they'll lose loads of jobs. So probably what is the most important agreement to come out of COP28 will be the loss and damage agreement, will be the recognition that actually the so-called global north or the industrial, industrialized nations of the world, they need now to invest in the rapid developing economies, help them rapidly decarbonize not help, that sounds really, pat I don't mean that, enable that rapid decarbonization, invest in it, put your shares and your stocks in it. But I think this notion that we can expect rapidly developing nations to not, to kind of ignore what we've been ignoring and, you know, they're already feeling the brunt of climate change to rapidly decarbonize without any investment from us is ridiculous. And so we, we're all in this together. Climate change has no borders. So loss and damage, serious amounts of funding going into rapidly growing economies to enable that growth to be clean and to be green. That's certainly a, a uh, aggressive strategy and, and certainly one that will be challenging in the extreme to get uh, countries to buy into that. I know the Biden administration was kind of pushing back on the language of the loss and damage um, fund that was going to be created because they don't want to create a un a blank check for the damage that the United States has probably been a big contributor to. So uh, you're listening to the climate, to a climate change. This is Matt Mattern and I've got Sally Urin on the program who is the environmental scientist uh, for forum for the future. And we'll be right back in just one minute. Listening to a climate change and I've got Dr. Sally Urin on the program. Uh, Sally, you're going to cop 28, um, and and in Dubai, there there's certainly a lot of going to be a lot of business people from the fossil fuel industry there. But these people are also innovators, entrepreneurs, and smart enough to realize that the future is going to be one that has less oil in it uh, because of uh, our need to to make this transition. So they're not stupid. Uh, they they recognize, and that's probably why they are having the COP at, at, uh, in Dubai, is because the smart money realizes this. they have to make the transition. Um, do you think they, that uh, their energy and innovation can be harnessed effectively 
uh, for the environmental movement and for good? I think anything is possible. And I think that is totally possible. Is it probable? I don't know. Um, I think we really are at a sort of crossroads when it comes to sustainability. I think we all know we need to do something differently. And I think you have really smart people in oil and gas that know they need to do something differently. There are real barriers. We've talked about them, short-term horizons, investor attitudes that make it harder to, to, to make that transition. So in the end, I do think we need to rely on human creativity, innovation, and that ability to sort of reimagine how, how we do things. And that might mean you know, giving up some things that we hold dear for, for all of us, perhaps, but it also means getting something a bit different. And so I think, you know, the COP28 negotiations and all of the expo will be in the expo center in Dubai, which is, you know, a kind of testament to human imagination of what you can build in the middle of a desert. Um, and, you know, there are some real renewable energy plays there. I, I just, yeah, I think we're at the crossroads. And so if we're at a crossroads, what do we need to equip ourselves with to sort of take a different path? And first of all, I think it is that imagination to think of a different energy system, to conceptualize a different food system. I think it is about accessing the capital that will support that transition. But I think most of all, when we look back over this moment in our history, it will be a story of courage, I think, and bravery. I actually think that's what it will come down to, whether or not there are humans knocking around this planet of ours, this beautiful planet of ours, by the end of the century, it will be a human story as to whether or not we're here or not, because actually it's down to us as humans. We've got all the technology, we've got all the money, we know the solutions, we just need to be better humans. So who would you, speaking of better humans, who would you put on your your Mount Rushmore of climate change activists uh, who are who've made kind of the difference thus far or that are an inspiration to you? That could be people that are unknown, but uh, are still inspiring to you. Yeah. Um, well, I would say this because it's a woman, perhaps, but Christiana Figueres is amazing. Um a wonderful mix of tough talk, but that kind of stubborn optimism, which I, I really relate to. I would also describe myself as a stubborn optimist. Um, I would also leave space for those entrepreneurs that are at the edge of our system right now that are coming up with brilliant ideas that will get scaled. Um, and you know, I'm inspired by some industry figures. I'm, you know, inspired by people like Mark Carney, ex-governor of the Bank of England, has really done a lot to try and galvanize action in the finance system. But actually, I don't think we need heroes right now. I think we need us all to realize what this agenda means to us and for us all to do something about it and not imagine that we're victims we're not and I always use this quote by Buckminster Fuller Buckminster Fuller yeah, U.S. architect you know he he said a long time ago we're called to be architects of our future not victims and that's all of us and so hoping that a hero will save us I think is a false hope I think actually we've all got a role to play that role might be slightly different some roles might be more impactful than others but this is down to all of us. We can't rely on a hero to save us now. We've got to all shift. Well, I I will say that to me is brilliant. And I, I totally agree with this, that uh, everybody has a role to play. I guess uh, going in that direction, what a, what would you say to people about finding that role uh, and uh, and following that role and making that change? I think, first of all, this notion that we can rely on um, individuals to be, part, you know, to kind of, we can't put all the reliance on individuals. So I'm not, I'm not saying that because, we, you know, disproportionately, the private sector governments have got more 
agency, more levers that they can pull. So we need the private sector and government to really start to pull those levers seriously and with intent. But guess what? Politicians listen to people. What they care about are votes. And that is down to what we think as individuals. And so I would say to anybody, find your voice. Tell people what you think about this agenda. Find out more about it. I'm still struck, but when, whenever I do a presentation on, and here is the current trajectory of our climate, it could be six degrees hotter by the end of the century. It's like it's news. And you're like, hang on a minute, why? How do you not know this? Um, so wake up, pay attention. This stuff matters. And every dollar you spend sends a signal to a politician to a brand owner. These systems are all interconnected. Don't think you have no power or agency. Everybody does. Just think about it. Right. It's a tide. And so maybe at first it's a small ripple and it's one person that you talk to, but you keep talking every day to different people. And pretty soon it's hundreds of people that you're having these conversations with. And and uh, then it starts to move the needle a little bit more and and then also kind of engage really engaging in politics, maybe not just voting, but uh, going out there and, and campaigning for people who support your ideas and, and putting your, your money where your mouth is in terms of giving money to political candidates that support environmentally sustainable uh, positions. And, and then all of a sudden politicians start listening a little bit more to those of us who are making these noises. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, many politicians would say there's no votes in to the sustainability agenda. I would really challenge that. I just think there's sometimes a lack of engagement, a lack of awareness, and people can be overwhelmed by this agenda. It is overwhelming. It is complex. But it affects all of us, the people that we love, particularly, you know, I have three children and I worry about the world they're heading into. So I really care. And we all need to care. At it. And I, I get there's a cost of living crisis. Um, many families, you know, here in the UK, in the US, you know, they've, they've got other things I really need to worry about. So for those of us, you know, that are in positions of influence, let's use that influence and we absolutely need business and government to step up both of them together in collaboration in cooperation well let's let's take an exercise of imagination say you're queen for the day what are the top three to five strategies that you would say are most uh impactful in in moving us towards the direction of uh solving the problems of climate change. And I realize there are hundreds of potentials, so this is not the easiest question out there. Um, it isn't the easiest question, but I think what I would do is I would evaluate all the different policy mechanisms that would facilitate a rapid transition of finance into sustainable energy, into sustainable food. So at the moment, Access to capital, I think, is one of the biggest issues. There isn't enough of it. It's not flowing through quickly enough. You've got investors that aren't convinced yet that this is where they need to put their money. So I would introduce a carbon market overnight, introduce that full price of carbon, make those externalities factored in. I wouldn't pass that cost on to the consumer. That would be a terrible idea. It's not fair to do that. It doesn't need to happen. But I would pull some very big policy levers to transition our economy, because I think if the economy transitions, the other nested transitions, of food, of health, of energy will follow through. We lost you at uh, policy levers. Can you repeat that or just? Oh, sorry. Um, I would look at all the big policy levers that we could pull to transform how capital flows in our economy and to ensure that that capital is flowing into sustainable energy, sustainable food, sustainable healthcare, probably by putting a value on the price of carbon that gets factored into every investment decision that's made. I would transform the investment community and just unlock the power of finance to accelerate the investment and access to innovation that, that we need. 
all the solutions are there. We know what needs to happen. And I would also make it illegal to report on quarterly profit returns. Well, I think uh, that's that's brilliant. I, I really like the pricing carbon and and uh, you know back twenty some years ago, uh, President Bush was was talking about pricing carbon. Uh, you know, but unfortunately, that never happened. Um, you know, and he was an oil guy. So I mean, it's something that is is elegant and it helps solve the problem most effectively. I mean, that's that's the best part of it. So that would be the first thing I would do. I just put a price on carbon. I would put in also mechanisms to make sure that price isn't transferred to goods and services because it doesn't need to be, that that price is hypothecated and allocated within capital markets. That's a fascinating uh, switch. And I guess, you know, you could give some kind of tax rebate to people who are yeah. lower, lower income people uh, so that they don't bear the brunt of it. But people Completely. who are who are upper income can afford to, if you're going to buy a carbon intensive product, you pay the full price yeah. for that product. Uh, but if you're, Completely. If, you're, if you're a lower income person, you don't have to. Well, uh, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. Um, please come back and talk to us in, in the future. Maybe after you go see cop 10, 28, uh, great, you know, best of luck there. And uh, you've been listening to a climate change. This is Matt Mattern. And I've had Dr. Sally Yuren on the program. Please uh, follow her on social media as well as uh, follow our show. Check us out at climatechange.com or check us out on Spotify, Apple, iHeart, or any of the other platforms we're on. Have a great day, everybody, and tune in next week. Thank you.